Thank you, Bob. Here we are. <laughs> so, what's up? Questions, comments, hints about how to become enlightened? <laughs> Instantly are welcome, or gradually. Um, so I'm a little uh, curious of what you would say about the, the role of faith in Buddhist practice. Um, say more. What brings that question uh, to you? Well, just that I... Um, I think of I think of the practice as you know there are, uh, one of the tenets that I understand is that you know you have to in, in, investigate everything for yourself and verify you know through your own experience what yeah. what's true and yet I you know in various sources I read about how you know you gotta at a certain point you gotta kind of make a leap and know that. I don't know. I mean, you know, we we talk about Mahamudra, and you know that there are these things out there that you know, believe it or not, they're you know, we're heading that way. You know, um, so I don't know. I just <clears throat> I'm just curious if you're in your experience if there's like. Any contradiction there? No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> sometimes no. Sometimes yes, actually. Depends on uh, which day. That's such a good question. I think there's a whole book written with the title Faith in Buddhism. Um, I think it's Sharon Salzberg, so in the Vipassana insight meditation tradition, but uh, I haven't read it. I read reviews of it, which sounded very interesting. So a couple of other things come to mind. And you already alluded to one, like the Buddha, the Buddha basically said, don't uh, take everything I say, you know, and just go and bow to it and do it. You... Um, the, the constant metaphor is it's like gold. You have to test it. Make sure you've got the real gold instead of fool's gold. So the sutra <coughs> refers to bite it, burn it, smash it, all of which are like work with it. <coughs> work with it in your own life. And if you try different things and they don't, uh, they don't lead you away from suffering, they say, don't throw them out, but just put them on the back burner, you know? Um, like, okay, so you hear about deity practice or doing some nundro, and that doesn't particularly draw you right now, or, or it's kind of like, I can't see why anybody do that. Just, we don't have to reject it. We can put it on the side and keep doing what makes, what's helpful to our lives in reducing suffering. And the other thing I think of, and I want to hear from Bill and Dora about this, because it's quite a good, deep question, um, is the Dalai Lama once, when he was asked about that, said, um, in Buddhism, his experience is it's faith based on reason. So what he means by that is uh, your, your own experience that you reason about. So it's not that kind of faith like some Christian uh, religions encourage, you know, just you'll never understand how this works. Just believe it and act on the belief, you know. We don't really have beliefs so much in Buddhism, which is another interesting word that comes up 
tied to faith, you know. We don't really have so many beliefs because you're not required to believe anything, period. And whereas in Christianity there's arguments like you must believe Jesus is the Son of God, you must believe this or that, or you're not technically this type of Christian, you know. So we don't do that. And I find that um, very encouraging, you know, that it is based on my experience. And yet, it's not just wide open <clears throat> because there's these guidelines constantly, like the four thoughts, the four immeasurables, the six perfections. They aren't beliefs, they're practices, really. And then, um, there was one that there was gonna say, oh, yeah, is that helpful? Well, just reiterating that it is always important to study. So read something and then contemplate, does that fit my experience? Is that, you know, does it work for me? And then meditate. And when we do those three things, we are, we are working the path. So for me, so that's all the things I've learned. For me, my own personal experience, <clears throat> I don't know where my faith came from in my teacher. Um, and I'm talking about uh, my teachers, I should say, Lana Michael, uh, Venerable Children. It seemed mysterious to me, actually. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it was like, what? <laughs> what am I going to do? I mean, they, they want me to do this hundred syllable mantra, you know, okay, in a language I don't know. I guess it took some kind of faith and I don't really, I'm not sure I would put that word on it, but there was a deep connection instantly, especially with venerable children. And I, I just started following what she was doing because somehow I, I had faith in how she was in the world is what I would say. Seeing someone in the world act with so much ethical discipline and yet such a loving kindness and so much intelligence. So I saw that and it, in, I, maybe it's inspiration more than faith. But then as, as, uh, as I would do what she suggested, the faith would increase because it was like, yeah, I see this stops some of my suffering patterns in me. So then, then to me, that's tied back to his holiness, faith based on reason, because it makes sense is what I'm saying. Yeah, so, and maybe confidence is oh, a, yeah. a better word for that's that. That's an excellent word. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking when you say that? Just maybe you meant more confidence? Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've had the same experience that you're talking about. And yeah. It's, um, I, don't, I, I don't know, it's just, it just the, it's, has struck me when I've come across, you know, in various writings, like, you, you know, there's an element of faith, like you've got to have this, this yeah. faith. Yeah. And, um, <coughs> I don't, yeah. You know, I don't think they're lying. <laughs> you know, I, I just, but I, uh, it just strikes me as a little odd from my perspective yeah. to think of it that way. Yeah. I mean, be, because, I, and I'm just saying, you know, swapping out the word confidence because it's fra faith is so freighted. Yeah, yeah, I think it's freighted with our Judeo-Christian yeah. kind of background. Like, right. is that sort of some kind of magical thing? And confidence is is so much clearer, I think, for my, me too, because that's what I'm talking about. The confidence in the practice has grown. Um, the confidence in the teacher has grown. And the other thing I began to notice that teachers lend us their confidence in our Buddha nature. Like for example, I had pretty much no confidence in my own goodness. 
forget Buddha nature, just being a good person. When I started, it was like, well, I thought I was pretty good, but inside I was like, no, I know I'm pretty much a mess. <laughs> and, um, but the teacher uh, had this incredible confidence in my ability and all the students she has, the ability to move um, so you can reveal your Buddha nature to yourself. And I didn't have that, but she had it. So it, I call it lending. There was sort of a feeling of my confidence is growing because that person thinks I have something I don't think I have, like that. And that, to me, is a really powerful, beautiful kind of dynamic there. Yeah. What, what to add in to the mix? It's interesting how uh, a number of the words that we could choose have different impacts, even though we might actually be trying to point at the same thing. Uh, and from the point of from the point of view of um, of practice, confidence is probably the most accurate term in terms of what is needed in order to practice. Uh, if we actually just, uh, it's just like, well, I don't, maybe, I don't know, it could be this way, it could be that way, we probably won't actually try to engage. It's, it's very hard to engage if, uh, for more than uh, just a moment of novelty without some kind of confidence. It's hard, to, it's hard to walk in the door of a strange place like this without some, some kind of confidence. And that's different than belief, uh, and it's different than faith. And, and those, those words to me have more a sense of, there, there is something that I know beforehand. There's something like, I know that, that you know, God exists. I, there's a, it's a kind of a piece of knowledge, uh, and that that kind of a, uh, that kind of I, there's a piece of knowledge about something that I don't have direct connection or experience with. So that that kind of thing, and in in this case, it's more a matter of well, we may we may be inspired by the example of somebody, we may be inspired by the kind of the resonance of what the way something is articulated in the Dharma. And based on that inspiration, we'll have some, some, uh, some kind of enthusiasm or some kind of uh, mag or magnetized in a certain way to try something. And then as we, as we try it and we test it out, then a certain, a certain kind of confidence comes out. And I think the, the word there, there, there are uh, the word that's often translated as faith in uh, in Tibetan, dipa, dipa, and there, there are three, there are three types, and one of them is this kind of this initial enthusiasm or kind of the inspiring. Oh, just like you, you, uh, you hear the Dalai Lama say something that's like, wow. And so you, then, you, then you want. It, then somebody else says, "Oh, the Dalai Lama is going to come and speak in Portland." And you go, "Oh, really?" And you, you want to go, and, and then you you chew on it and you start to have some experience with it, uh, and so and then uh, then through that experience comes a, a kind of certainty, which is not mm -hmm. a certainty of knowing something that you can't know that you can only sort of point out indirectly, it's certainty about the actual experience because it's, it's first person experience at that point. So that, yeah, I, I found it helpful to kind of go through that because I had uh, the freight car that uh, <laughs> with faith was pretty full. <laughs> it was not full of things that I found particularly helpful. It was actually things I found kind of embarrassing to think I would associate with. Um, but people, people have very different um, uh, sensibilities. And so for some people, 
just a, a sense a sense of certainty that's beyond the sense of certainty that I I would personally think would be healthy for me that's actually a motivating factor to have that kind of sense of sort of surrender to something bigger uh, but it's not necessary I'm, I'm just sort of putting in a good word that we don't try to say ooh that's 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 wrong somehow because some for some people that might be a, a really yeah. active and very meaningful and motivating thing and allow for something really profound to happen for them mm -hmm. so, so. Once, I, when I was originally struggling with this, I was thinking about um, the, the impact of some of these words, and then thinking about what it would, how it is if, if when, when you're a kid and you first see some people playing a game, mm -hmm. and it looks, you, you don't have, you don't, the ball is way too big for you, you know, you're, <laughs> you're five years old and these people are, throwing this ball, the, this basketball, this giant thing, and they're throwing it way up in the air and it's going through this hoop and you say, wow. <laughs> uh, but you, so you want to do that. So that, that kind of enthusiasm, you, you, want, you want to jump in, you want to do it, you want to try it. And, and when I kind of shifted over to that, thinking, oh, actually, there, there's something that I can see in my own experience about how that kind of enthusiasm and being magnetized, and then figuring out how to do it and growing into it. Those, I think that's, in a certain way, that for me is a, was a more helpful lens to look at it. Yeah, and I think the teacher functions like someone who sees you on the sideline, like, <laughs> I'd like to, but I know I can't. And they say, come on, I think you can. Because they say, yeah, because I used to stand there and go like that. So, you know, that's why I love it. It's not, it's so, it's so not uh, airy-fairy, you know, it's so... It's so like step by step, and you can actually reason it out how how I got to where I am, and uh, it that word certainty is a uh, you know the torch of certainty. It's a term of art in the Kagyu tradition, and it it really is based on that. I have experienced this. I know I have. There's no one who can tell me. I haven't, or it's wrong, or it's right. It's way beyond all that, you know. And that that's just so wonderful <laughs> that we can do that. It's amazing, you know. It can never be taken away. It doesn't matter what anyone says. Even, even I don't know, Jesus, the Pope, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, anybody. Yeah. Uh, who's got the mic? Oh, over here. Um, so, I guess to piggyback off that, but I've, it's, maybe it's a different direction. Like certainty, having certainty or devotion, I kind of like the word devotion, like my intention is to pursue something that I can see is good, like the benefit of all beings, things like that. But um, the, I've been thinking about um, people who have kind of some sort of affliction, um, like a habitual pattern, maybe an addiction, like gambling, something like that, where they can truly see and probably write like a roster of the reasons why that's not helpful <laughs> and damaging, yeah. yet they keep doing it. Yeah. Again and again and again, even though even in the moment, even in the moment of acting, they might see that it's harmful, but they keep doing it. Something's trapping them there. So, it's like they wa they're watching themselves do it, and there's a clarity, there's an insight. But what is trapping them, and what is, like what would we, um, you know, as practitioners, offer as advice to those people? Um, I kind of get that from a psychological standpoint, you know, like a Western psychoanalytic framework or something, but what would we say as Buddhists? 
I don't know. Everything I've tried, I mean, I grew up in a family with addictions, and um, I'm pretty sure now, from my where I sit now, uh, telling them anything doesn't help. <laughs> and I think I'm learning to stop that kind of useless help. Uh, and I am unsure about this, but I'm exploring it. Modeling is good. Just model a good life and love them. Love them with all that muck. <laughs> and <clears throat> and um, I, I'm more getting a sense that These, these really strong habit patterns that people have, uh, that they are, well, here's, here's what I'm working on. A, they're empty. They, are, they aren't as solid as I make them, because when I make them solid, I start getting anxious, and I gotta do something, and I wanna help, and blah, 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 blah. and, and uh, so, I don't mean go nihilist, you know, but really see it's changing, it's impermanent, it had causes and conditions. Um, probably from watching my dad go through severe alcoholism and then come out of it and become an AA sponsor by the time I was five or six. That was a pretty amazing journey as a kid. and. I, I, it gave me some sort of sense of, wow, these things really turn around at some point, and they don't turn around from my mom yelling at him or, or nagging him or his boss uh, after him. They turn around from something else. So uh, then I just want to say one other thing, kind of backed up. I don't mean don't do anything. It depends on your connection with the person. Um, what you do, but but we, you know, the mechanism to me is the same mechanism that I have of grabbing a human body over and over every time I die, and of bringing all my habit patterns through the bardo to the next thing. It's the same one. It's not like, oh, these folks with an addiction have some kind of different habit pattern going on. It's got different flavors and, and appearances, but the mechanism is the same. So why do I do that? Ignorance. It's pure, almost stubborn ignorance that's been fed over lifetime after lifetime to not see my own Buddha nature and that of others. Just not being able to see, not, not believe in, but to experience. And the more I experience it, the more those patterns just kind of fall away. I used to drink and smoke cigarettes and have sex with strangers. <laughs> and I just think about that and I go, that was in this life? Like, oh my God. You know, it just seems like totally some other life. Yeah, and I can't. But it's not that long ago. <laughs> right. And I can identify with that myself. Of course, I have patterns yeah. that I see yeah. and that I continue to, <laughs> to hold on to, you mm -hmm. know, that are difficult to let go. And it's, it's just kind of strange, you know. Um, if it's not the insight or clarity that that's harmful that brings about the change, what is it? Maybe it's just like a deeper, like super deep level of ignorance beyond kind of rationally knowing that it's wrong, it's harmful or something. I don't know. Well, the bottom level of ignorance, according to the teachings as I have studied and heard, is that <laughs> it's the ignorance of reality. You know, it's that other self ignorance. Because based on that, all the rest unfolds. So that's pretty deep, because we've been working on it for a long time. We've been working to build it for a long, long time. So it's going to take, it could take a while to undo it. The Kagyupas teach that it can happen like that. <laughs> 
and in moments, that's for sure, I think. And then you uh, just repeat those, you know, and then pretty soon you live in that. And we see, we see beings who are living free of suffering, you know. I, I just always think of Kempo Lodrodonia. I mean, he just goes around bubbling like joy. And, and things get hard, and he's still just kind of bubbling this joy. It's like, wow, what's that about? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. But one thing I'm starting to do is watch out for my urge to help, my urge to try this, try that. Sometimes it can be too invasive for the person. And I don't know what it means to, to just love them. But I try and think about that now or just experiment. See someone on the street who's, you know, I, I feel averse to and just play in my mind like, could I just love them? Could I just stand there and love them? And usually I can't quite, but I'm aiming at it. I guess um, part of it is just not necessarily like feeling compelled to magically cure them or something. Mm -hmm. It's more just I'm curious like what happens internally to a person when they finally like come to or like what is that magic juice <laughs> that yeah. that they something clicks even though that they could you know tell they've told you the problem millions of times what happens yeah. in, internally you I know? just think it's it's so complex causes and conditions huge numbers of them but I think about like my dad's story um, he he uh, had this friend named Joe Boyer and I don't know how they even met maybe they met drinking. And um, Joe ran into Bill, the guy that founded Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this was in the 40s. My dad was older, and I'm 71. So, um, and um, Joe said, man, you just got to come hear this guy. He's just, like, fabulous. And my dad met that. They went on the train to, where was it, Wisconsin or wherever this guy was starting um, AA for the first time. So if I was like five, that was 1952. Um, and my dad came back like converted. It wasn't like he quit drinking immediately, but he saw a light at the end of a long tunnel, um, generations of drinking. And uh, he just started turning it around with that kind of help, but who knows karmically, why does Joe show up, why does Bill, uh, you know, all these causes and conditions are so multiple, and it's all karmic, karmically complex, but thank goodness, I've always been so happy that happened, because at a very young age, I got a message that you can turn around from total hell, you know, and you can go the other way, yeah, yeah, thanks. I don't know anything about this from the inside. Yeah. I don't I don't actually have much close up experience of it at all. But one thing that occurs to me is that uh if certain things come to fruition, the causes are not necessarily proximate. It's not yeah. necessarily yeah. something that happened yesterday. That you can point at. And, and that, or that you can easily point at. Uh, and so the, uh, I think the bigger mis mystery in a certain way is even though we may not think that uh, we're doing something effective, that yeah. perhaps we are. That measuring, measuring a certain kind of outcome over a short term may not be the, that might not actually be the, the, the whole picture, yeah, not the right metric. It yeah. might be for, uh, for somebody who uh, knows all kinds of methods and, is, uh, and, and knows kind of how, how everything works. And I could imagine with certain kinds, just like a mechanic, uh, you, you don't go to a mechanic with sort of this mystical understanding that they might walk around your car and maybe sometime in the future it would get fixed. There's something very, very straightforward. And I think in, in the realm of certain, certain aspects of addiction treatment, 
probably a, a lot of things are known. So there, there are some people who are going yeah. to be equivalent of mechanics who, who know more, but even mechanics can't fix all cars. <laughs> so there, there, certain things will work and certain things won't work in different cir circumstances. But the, the long-term uh, seeds that are planted, I think, are very important. And so the, your uh, suggestion to, to love and also not even knowing what that means, I think, is very significant. Uh, one, of this, one of the stories that Michael has told on uh, several occasions, I think some of you probably re remember it, uh, about being, I think it was with Karma Tinley in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. What's that? Probably. Yeah, probably Karma yeah. Tinley. Yeah. And um, being in the park and uh, there's some, an alcoholic, somebody obviously alcoholic coming in panhandling and wanting some money and Michael's initial response is oh river shake don't you know don't get involved don't get involved but uh Carmen Tinley uh, engaged with this guy and he said so what what do you actually what do you want what do you want and he said well this kind of you know some kind of malt liquor or something you know something and he said well where can you get it and so over there at this, you know, this little corner store. So Carmen Tinley went and got a bottle. He said, is this it? And the guy says, yes. And Carmen Tinley said, well, just wait, just wait. And so he opened it up, and he did this, uh, this little soak offering thing and then <laughs> gave the guy, you know, said, here it is then. And he was not trying, he was not figuring out that he was going to, like, fix this thing right now. But he was looking for something, something else, some other kind of seed to plant in that situation. And I think that that's important. Uh, uh, it's been that that little example has been helpful for me. I have not I have not bought anybody uh, a bottle of Old English 800 or anything else, uh, uh, or done that. But it's actually allowed me to interact with people in a way that's uh, more just more immediate when I, th I think there's some, some, some kind of situation that normally I would, I would judge it. But I'm, I'm still cautious, you know, in certain kinds of situations. I don't feel like there, this creates some kind of reason to be totally fearless of everybody. Uh, but it's, a, it's different when you can actually just sort of be with somebody in a, a kind of an authentic way, uh, without some sense that you, they have to be the, they have to be a comfortable kind of person, or they have to, you know, maybe they're not comfortable. But now, but right after you smile and say hello, they will turn into a really comfortable person just because you were so cool and how you could smile. Uh, it, it's not like that, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's, 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 I think it's, I, I certainly haven't plumbed any of the many mysteries involved. I think it's good to hold it as mysterious and just, you know, whatever happens. I was in the, the park um, last year and uh, I was just walking through and uh, I was uh, doing some mantra, just kind of trying to keep my mind good you know, because the park is, can get really weird. <laughs> and this is a park where a lot of people uh, gather and drink and, and kind of make a lot of noise. And, uh, and so I was just walking through there and I was doing a mantra and this woman, who I'm sure I never saw before in my whole life, saw me and went, Hi, it's you. And she came running over and threw her arms around me. <laughs> it was so startling because it wasn't one of those things where when she got close, I went, oh, her. Never saw her before. And I just decided in the moment, probably because I was doing mantra, just, okay. She thinks she knows me. She thinks we're best friends. 
I just hugged, I said, God, it's great to see you. And she said, yeah, it's just wonderful. And then her, she was with a guy, and he came up and said, yeah, great, okay, well, bye. And off they went, and I was just like, <laughs> whatever. And, it, and I, you know, um, it's, it also has to do with whatever package you're in. I've noticed that I can kind of maneuver around the world because I'm an older woman. I'm probably the least scary kind of package for some people. Um, and because sometimes when I'm with guy friends, they're like, no, I can't do that, you know, because they're going to feel threatened by me, you know. But I can kind of do that much more than when I was younger, so I like that. But these things just unfold, and you're just like, whatever, whatever that was, you know, may they be well and happy, maybe it was a blessing for her, maybe some mind thing came because of the mantra, maybe not, I don't know, <laughs> but it makes it more interesting, <laughs> right, just being open. Well, I don't know if official addictions are like a whole other thing or if they're just more of what I have. <laughs> I'm just so I don't I don't technically know like, you know, biologically and all that how that is, but I certainly feel I can look in myself and that you know, it's worth looking at, you know, why is it, you know, why is it that I choose in some moment to read another news story before I go and sit on my cushion? So right there, that's like, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I feel like it's, it has, something to, you know, and why do we, that's one of the reasons we contemplate the four thoughts, and, you know, we're, we actually have to, I, I think it's, it's partly like the news stories, okay, I can kind of get the attraction, but I think the, the thing to work on there is more, how do I remind myself of why I want to sit on the cushion? Like, there needs to be enough pull to the alternative. And so, and of course, sitting can some, you know, is a variable thing. So sometimes it's really cool and I really wish I had more time, whatever. Other times it's like, ah, uh, you know, and so, so it's not like, you know, it's not quite as guaranteed as like having a, uh, you know, ice cream with hot chocolate <laughs> sauce on it or something. Yeah. So. So I feel like there's, that's part of our practice is to find ways to remind, not to remind ourselves, but also cultivate the attraction, cultivate the attraction of the things that we said we wanted to do more of, yeah. you know, to really to contemplate like, oh yeah, remember like how good that felt to give somebody something like remember that and and then maybe I'll do it again, you know. Yeah. So I think we forget that that's, you know, maybe I tend to feel like, oh, that should just be automatic and you know, here at once, yeah, I want to do that and I just put in my mind I want to do that, but actually it takes more work to cultivate that that motivation, I think. For some reason in the human realm, it's much easier to fall down the hill than to climb up. <laughs> and I really see it like that, you know. I have the same kind of pattern, like I know I'm gonna I know I'm gonna do my practices and then I go off and do one more little thing. One more little thing right before and I watch myself do it, like and then I say Huh. Now, if you drop dead right now, Sopa, <laughs> which of these would you like to be engaged in? That's one of mine that's helping 
like, oh, okay, if I'm gonna drop dead, I guess I'd rather be on the cushion than, you know, you know, little things that I have to go fix or finish or, oh, the NPR just said they're gonna talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't miss that. <laughs> but which one's gonna matter? when the consciousness is sprung from the body. Not the stories from NPR, probably, as much as did, did we tame our minds. Those aren't bad. But I also really love that phrase of low-level happiness. When my teacher gave it to us, I really started watching. Yeah, like ice cream's great, but it is a low-level happiness. <laughs> For many reasons, it's so impermanent. It, it's, you know, sometimes not got great consequences for your body. It's not to never do it, but it's like categorize it correctly, for goodness sake, you know. So if there's no other questions, we could end a little bit early. It's dark, rainy, cold. <laughs> Get home 10 minutes earlier. How's that sound? Yes, yeah, see what's on NPR, on OPB, <laughs> Master's Theater. <laughs> OK. Anything, anybody waiting? No. All right, let's dedicate. Thank you. By this virtue, may I quickly realize Mahamudra and establish all beings without exception in this state. Thank you. Have a good week. Hope to see you in a week or sooner. Be there or be round. Be there or be round. And Linda, we have your book. Yes. <laughs> we, we finally are putting you and the book together. <laughs> it's floated around. I'm so happy to come even for these last few minutes. I really needed to be here. Oh, you know, I know why. Because I was supposed to meet with Michael, and I had to cancel the meeting, so that's probably why. So there you go, karmic crisis. I know, yeah. Yeah, no, I was grading papers, and I am so far behind. Oh, you're still. And I was just like, I've just got to get through a few more. And then it was like, oh, no, it's 6.30. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it may come to that because I'm still going. <laughs>